The Unwilling Santa by Hannah Lloyd. Stomp, stomp, stomp. Old Mr. James shook the snow from his boots and coat with practiced ease. His heavy frown and wrinkled forehead made his actions cartoon-like as he tossed his coat onto the wire coat rack. He hunched his sturdy shoulders as he walked through the department store glaring at the brightly wrapped presents, decorated trees, and Santa's elves as they waved from every corner at him. I don't know why they have to go to so much trouble, Christmas is just something corporate made up to get their fingers into every American pocketbook and every woman's purse. He was so deep into his muttering that he didn't notice the slim, young girl staring up at him. He plowed right into her, and she gave a startled cry. Hey! He jumped back immediately, glancing down at his sparkling Alan Edmonds to make sure they weren't smudged, and then back up at the girl. What were you doing in my way, girlie? Her big Christmas red bow on her brown head trembled, but the white little face was set like flint. I'm very sorry, mister, but you weren't watching where you were going. She rubbed her arm where he ran into her and glared at him. And you hurt my arm. Mr. James stammered and stuttered as the little girl frowned. My mommy says you need to apologize when you hurt someone. She stood there, just waiting. Her little lips pursed in disapproval. Mr. James turned on his heel after a moment and stomped in the other direction. Humph he said, swinging his arms beside him. Her mother didn't raise her right, I guess. He opened the door to his office in the back and sat in his leather chair with a thud. Rolling up to the desk, he flipped open his laptop and placed in his noise-canceling earbuds. He hated Christmas music, so he listened to classical music at the loudest setting possible. Maybe that's why his hearing was going. He still wasn't sure. Time passed so quickly, that when he glanced up, it was nearly the end of the day, he rose and headed back to the end of the hall for his coat. Thrusting his arms into the sleeves, he turned up the collar, and faced the door, ready to head out into the onslaught of a snowy winter. Mr. Grouchy Man? He heard the little voice behind him, and he turned his head slightly, not acknowledging the voice, it continued on without missing a beat. Why aren't you in the Christmas spirit? At that, he whirled around and faced the little girl from earlier. Her jaunty bow still held in place, her big blue eyes held only curiosity. He tucked his chin into the collar of his coat and stared down at her. My name is James Claus, and no, I don't believe in Santa. Santa isn't real. The Christmas spirit is just a scam that people who want to make sales made up. There is no reason for me to be in the Christmas spirit and I wish everyone would stop asking me why I'm not. He was shouting, now, and the little girl blinked owlishly at him. You mean you don't like candy canes or sledding or snowmen? That's exactly what I mean, little girl, and where is your mother? Surely she didn't leave you here all alone? A lady, red burning in her cheeks, matching the wool coat she wore, hurried by the perfume counter. She was scanning the store, her head whipping around, until she caught sight of the little girl. Emily, why did you run off again? Emily glanced from Mr. James to the lady. Sorry, mother, I was just asking Mr. Gru I mean, Mr. Claus why he wasn't in the Christmas spirit. The lady stared at him. Mr. Claus, is that really your name? Mr. James grunted. I prefer to be called Mr. James, and, yes, it's really my name. Do you play Santa Claus? No, I do not play Santa Claus, he said, adamantly. And I will not be coerced into doing it. Emily sidled a step closer to him. Please, Mr. James, we have hot chocolate. What do you mean you have hot chocolate? Emily's mother smiled. I am the owner of a company who sets up in the middle of the mall. My Santa just called in sick earlier this morning. If I got you a fake beard and paid you what it was worth, would you be willing to do it for me? No. But. Mr. James crossed his arms. I said, no. The woman's eyes twinkled. What about if I let one of my other girls help you out behind the perfume counter while you did it? Your poor sales lady behind the counter could barely keep up. I'm sure you probably lost some sales because of it. Mr. James cleared his throat. Sales, did you say? And I would even pay my girl so that you don't have to. 
he stared at the lady in front of him incredulously. You really need a Santa, don't you? Her lips formed into a thin line, and she crossed her arms across her chest. Sir, some of these kids that come in here are very poor. They need whatever Christmas cheer that we can bring them. If you don't want to do it, I will continue my search, but I will have to cancel tomorrow. Emily tugged on the sleeve of his coat. Please? He sighed loudly. Fine, but only until you find someone else. Yay! Emily jumped up and down, clapping her hands. Her bow flopped crazily over her head, and Mr. James almost smiled. Not quite, but almost. The woman, whose name he learned was Susie Clements, hurried him off to the middle of the mall. She rummaged through large, plastic bins until she found a Santa suit. She held it up in front of her, shaking it out, and Mr. James smelled the distinct scent of mothballs. He wrinkled his nose, do I have to wear that? Unless you have a secret Santa suit that we don't know about, yes. Susie handed him the suit, a fake beard, and a floppy red hat and directed him toward the nearest restroom. Moments later, he emerged. Emily and her mother stared at him with wide eyes not moving a muscle. He stared back at them, what? Does it not look right? It's perfect, Mr. James. Emily breathed. Are you really Santa Claus? A smile spread across his face, a small smile, but a smile just the same. Good, he said, hurrying back to change into his regular clothes. And when no one could hear him, he muttered to just himself. I'm glad. The next morning, true to her word, Susie had a bright-eyed girl of 17 to work the perfume counter. She was a powerhouse, helping customers left and right. The store made more sales that day than they had made all week, but Mr. James wouldn't tell Susie that, of course. By that afternoon, Mr. James was suited up, an elf on either side of him, and practicing his very rusty. Ho, ho, ho. Emily giggled every time he tried. Mr. James? That doesn't sound normal. Then why don't you do it for me? She shook her head, curls swinging around her rosy cheeks. That would be silly, elves don't laugh like Santa. Kids in all shapes and sizes came through the line to see Santa that day. Big eyes stared up at him, asking for all manner of toys and games. His heart began to feel funny after a few hours, softer. Somehow, by the end of the day, he was smiling so big his face hurt. Susie appeared at his elbow, placing her hand on the head of a very tired elf named Emily. We're about done, Mr. Claus, but I have one more very special child to bring to you. She nodded at two people standing nervously by the corner. They bent over, and soon Mr. James saw a very small boy being wheeled to him in a wheelchair. The boy's legs were bent and shriveled, his body twisted and broken. When he saw Mr. James, a great big smile stretched across his face, and he raised skinny arms to his mother. Santa! The mother carefully lifted him and placed him on Mr. James' lap. This is Benji, Mr. Santa Claus, he's been waiting patiently all day to see you. Mr. James smiled down at the boy, but when he spoke, his voice cracked with emotion. What can I get you for Christmas, Benji? Benji's smile lit up the room. I don't want any toys or games. He said, thoughtfully, I want my mommy to be strong enough to take me Christmas caroling. Mr. James cocked his head. Why Christmas caroling, son? Because Santa, I want to tell people about the true meaning of Christmas. All of these toys and gifts don't matter much to someone who can't use them. He thumped his small chest with his left hand. But I want people to know that Christmas is about so much more. He paused and looked right into Mr. James' grizzled face. Do you know Silent Night, Mr. Santa? Mr. James nodded his head, a tear dripping down his grizzled cheek and into his fake beard. I do, son. Would you sing it with me? Mr. James nodded again, and when he spoke, his voice gruff. Of course I would. Benji leaned back against Mr. James' arm his clear young voice beginning the song, and one by one, his parents, Susie, and even Emily the elf joined in. Their voices blended as they sang about Christmas, and about a peaceful time. The hustle and bustle of the mall faded to silence as the song rang out through the rafters. Silent night, holy night. 
When they finished, Benji gave Mr. James a hug and waved goodbye as his parents wheeled him back the way that he had come. Mr. James dropped his head so no one could see the tears filling his eyes. He felt a small hand steal into his rough one and heard Emily's small voice beside him. If Benji can have the Christmas spirit, I think we can too, can't we, Mr. Claus? Mr. James Claus squeezed Emily's hand, smiling through his tears. We can, Emily, and I think me and you and your mom may just help out some certain folks Christmas curling tonight. As Mr. James rose to his feet, Emily's hand still in his, he looked around the mall with a new pair of eyes, the tacky Christmas decorations were the same. The loud, blinking lights still hurt his eyes, this time, though none of it bothered him. The reason to celebrate was not in the gifts, but now, it was in his heart. A Whimsical Adventure in Jasper Hello by Indy Whelan Under the midnight rain shower, a runaway evanced from the stonicold walls of the medieval castle deep into the Anthraction woods, the runaway slipped her royal blonde locks into her hooded tunic. She crunched through dead leaves and roamed past trees resembling upside-down spiders. Moonlight and bioluminescence and toadstools glowed, guiding her deeper into the woods. Unicorns trotted past wafting the scent of roses and the songs of the bullfrogs croaked. She was close. Through the break in the terrain was a tea-green lake flooded with earthy scents that welcomed you to the tiny village planted behind it. Jasper Hello. She found it. It was a bustling village lined with thatched cottages of pubs and shops. Fairy lights hung from the popular brewery Goblin's Grin. A cacophony of pub loafers whispering tales from drunken lips at the far end of the lane, where echoes ricocheted grew a disturbingly large oak tree. Casual onlookers categorized it as ordinary with its heavy black leaves and crimson bark but when peeking closely, a six-paned window displayed through the bark like a portrait with flickering lights winking from the inside like summer fireflies. Inside, the tree trunk door swallowed you into a dimension warp, it was a healthy-sized bookshop. However, this was a magical bookshop. Shelves compiled the shop lined with books in all the colors of the rainbow and heavens, books in divergent sizes as miniature as a thimble to the growth of an elephant's ear. Thunderclouds bellowed above near the back raining down puddles that evaporated into books. Thick books, old books, new books, books of all wonders, piped out steam, shook wildly as you passed by, and even tooted strong aromas, tonight's scent was honey and primrose. Paper lanterns floated around the shop from pages of old books that lost their covers. The shop owner was on the second-story loft reading from her purple rocking chair, wearing square-shaped spectacles. She gazed upwards from her reading material. The shop's open, take all the time you need. She smiled returning to her book as if she were never disturbed. One of these books has to break the curse, the runaway thought. A symphony of bubbles led the runaway to the center of the shop on a crescent moon-shaped carpet. The bubbles popped above a book displayed on a podium made from corals and shells. The runaway brushed aside the residue of sand over its cover before flicking it open with the sound of a crack. Water damage littered the pages in soft mildew pink, the pages smelled of seaweed and basalt. They were blank on the inside, read underwater only. The disclaimer was etched on the spine near the Atlantis crest branded on the top, it was a book about the fantastic underwater city. But it wouldn't break the spell, the runaway closed the book and followed her nose to the scent of smoke leading to a book covered in ruby-colored dragon scales. The pages were hot to the touch even through her leather gloves, cover to cover was filled with research of medieval dragonology but smoke billowing from every page turn made her eyes water. Paper butterflies tickled her ears distracting her from the book, she giggled at their invitation as they floated over to a potted maple tree raked in leathery green leaves coaxed in words. She began to read some of them, there were probably over 4,000. Each leaf produced words for different cooking recipes, she plucked off one that caught her senses. It was a brown leaf covered in tree sap that read the recipe for acorn pancakes while wafting the scent of butter and sugar cane. I still need to find a spell, she thought. The shadows crept into the edge of the shop where a vicious scratching sounded, in a dimly lit corner. 
An orange tawny with a dangling silver collar quarreled with the historic linens of a mummy dead on display in an open stone coffin. She tisked the cat away with a wave of her hand, carefully readjusting the ancient cloth to its original form. She saw the remains of handwriting. Studying hieroglyphs was a past hobby that she'd been passionate about. It was clear enough to decipher. In fact, it was the diary entries of this human dating decades back before the date of his death. Sweet woody smells from a crackling fireplace entranced the runaway to the west side of the shop where there seemed to be a traditional library. There was a velvet long back chair to the edge of a tall mahogany shelf with ordinary looking books. Fiction said a calligraphy painted poster on an easel. A small inscription was written below the title. The story and the characters from the book you complete will awaken into your own livelihood. She used a fingertip to brush the titles stitched on the spines, reading each and every one she stopped on a title labeled. The handsome lover, her finger shook with anticipation. Not today, she thought letting it go with a heavy sigh. And just when she thought it was too late, a wicked book lay opened under the skylight with star beams illuminating it like a halo. It had hundreds of ribbon bookmarks. The shop owner grinned while spying on her customer through her floorboard cracks. Are you here for a spell? The shop owner asked while she snaked her hand down the iron staircase. I need to break a curse, can you help me? The runaway rustled into her pants pocket and tossed the shop owner a tethered coin pouch. It was caught with a satisfying clank that pleased the owner greatly. Stand behind the spell book, it only works if a real witch recites the spell. Now tell me, child, what is the curse to which has been bestowed upon you? The runaway hesitated twirling her thumbs together. Clover looked to her then to her owner. I'll tell you, but thou mustn't judge. The runaway whispered gently into the shop owner's ear. Her eyes widened. For a witch, she'd heard it all, but this was iniquitous. The sun rised over the tea green lake. The rays of the sun ignited life into the anthraction forest. The runaway hoisted herself through wide muscular branches but halted to glance back once more to reminisce on Jasper Hallow. The oak tree was nothing but a speck no greater than a fairy's eye. But something about that shop made her whimsical adventure something she'd look forward to again and again. Theodore's Books by Julie Shetler Whenever my humble shop door opens, it's time for my scintillating performance. A homely bell welcomes my guest, it chimes on its own accord. Untouched by the door, snow waltzes in the open entryway for just a moment before a short girl emerges. She's breathless from the cold. I crouch back into the shadows, behind a looming bookcase I surrender to licking back a few strands of frizzy hair on my paws. There's no need to alarm my visitor straight away, let her browse. A ruby scarf is tangled around her face. She unwraps it, unbuttons her oversized coat, and long locks of orange hair fall to her waist. She blinks, her rosy face is sprinkled with pimples, freckles, and snowflakes. She hangs her winter armor on my antique hooks. Before she's even gotten her mittens off, I know I like this girl. Her hair is the same burning orange as my fur. Now, that's a fantastic color on anyone. She kicks the slush off her boots before walking further. I can tell she's a true bookworm by the glow in her eyes. She's certainly never seen so many books all together. Bookshelves, from ceiling to floor, stretch up and back forever. My shop has an atrium which never ends. She looks up and sees staircases which climb to infinity. As if sky was no matter, it's a mirage, but that's my little secret. In my bookshop, we let magic flourish. I can also tell she's confused, on some level. My guests are always bewildered by my shop's sudden appearance. She's walked this street dozens of times before, no doubt, but has never seen my shop. In fact, she's never even heard of Theodore's books, and if she has, she wouldn't have believed a word of it anyway. I've always been around, but I move from place to place. My bookshop is not bound to time and space like an ordinary store, just as I am not an ordinary house cat. It only appears for one person at a time. It's better that way. My focus is penetrating and only suitable for one guest only. My shop only ever appears once, so there's no chance for my guests to return with a crowd of skeptics. 
I know that if anyone ever tried to find their way back to my bookstore, they'd see whatever normally occupies the space, and it's usually just an abandoned warehouse or empty lot. When someone is in desperate need of inspiration, my shop becomes clear to them, it greets them on some familiar path. They're drawn to Theodore's books for it's a strange thing to see on a boulevard that they think they know well. And my target always comes in, like moths to a flame, I know all of them, their whole story long before they step through my door. Welcome, do ask if you need any help finding anything. I call out, keeping my body hidden, my Scottish accent is thick, though I am from nowhere at all. I lay back on my haunches, some say I'm meant for the jungle, but my velvet carpet is so luscious, I could never leave. Thank you, she says quietly. Candlelight flickers across her face, we haven't got any electricity, so it's a cozy ambience. She walks through the shelves, mine's a bookshop without genres, we don't even carry any of the classics or a single new bestseller. There are no titles or authors' names on the spines, she surveys my shelves. Eventually she chooses a book, when she picks up her choice. And what a good selection! My emerald eyes glow from behind the bookshelf, she's got strong intuition, going right for that one. The young girl shrieks, she drops her selected book and dashes towards the door. But I am swift, much more spry than little girls. With a single leap, I'm past the bookcase, over the girl, and blocking her only exit, I swish my tail, my victory is palpable, as per usual. I lay my massive glorious body in front of the doorway, I try not to look intimidating, just lounging and stretching. A tiger. She yelps. She's frozen in fear, but not completely still, as I can see her whole body shaking. It's worse than when she came in from the cold, I pity her. Yet. It's so predictable, my guests' fear is an important element in my facade, it helps me break down their walls. My guest must be vulnerable and disarmed, in order for any of this to be worthwhile. Hash, I would never hurt you, little peanut. I coo in as soothing a tone I can muster, there's a purr in my voice. You see can talk? She peeps with a stutter, her eyes are wide. Yes, indeed, you'll find I have quite an extensive vocabulary too. I reply and casually check that my claws are keeping their sharp edges, they shimmer in the candlelight. My undivided attention can be a bit overwhelming, so I let her recover from her initial shock first. Are you wearing glasses? She asks, I can hear a grin in her voice, her shoulders fall back and she stands tall. I can almost smell the fear melting off her, it leaves her aura and she glows. Of course, little peanut, how else could I read all these books? I ask, my paws gesture towards the lavish collection. Then I take off my golden wire frames and brush the lenses against my fur, my dramatic effect is less effective when they're dusty. I can't believe I'm talking to a tiger, is this a dream? No, it's not, but by all means don't take my word for it, tell me, have you ever been able to tell time in your dreams? No not once. She replies, I can almost see the gears in her brain turning, trying to make sense of her strange encounter. So why don't you check your watch? I ask. Following my suggestion, she gazes at her left wrist, the clock face appears normal, with hands ticking and numbers staring back at her. So you must be Theodora then? She queries. Yes, indeed. I say. Now my gaze is fixed on her, the jade glow in my eyes captivates her, She's cute as a fairy. Innocence radiates from her, and I know exactly why she's here. For I know the story of every human destined to rise and fall in this dimension, even the small. Let me tell you, little peanut, I have just the perfect book for you. I call out, I am pacing the shelves. Really? She asks. Yes, there's a book in here with the future of every human ever born. I say with confidence. No way. She shouts. It is true, there are even books here for those who are yet to be born. So you can tell me about my family, celebrities, and historical figures. Can you even tell me about characters in fairy tales? She asks, her words are going a mile a minute. No, that would be a rather intrusive invasion of their privacy, Brooke Avery Scott. We will only discuss your fate today. I answer. Whoa, how do you know my name? She asks because right here is your book. 
I take a leather-bound masterpiece from the shelf. Let me see. She stretches out her precious hands. No chance, little peanut. If you were to touch this book, you would turn into a toad. I say. Really? She asks, her face paling. Oh, absolutely, it would be instantaneous. You wouldn't even remember your own life. You'd think you started out as a wee little tadpole, and, anyways, I just love the taste of toad. I lick my lips with a flare of fangs. She gulps. I flick through the pages, the supple cover rests on my paws. I can feel its intricate carvings, they're like rivulets passing secrets to my veins. Tell me, how was your day yesterday? I ask. Brooke breaks my piercing gaze, she looks down at her feet, she leans back and forth slightly. Speak from your heart, little peanut. I encourage her. I had a very bad day. She answers, I can see tears welling up in her eyes. Now, now tell old Theodore what's going on. I say. Yesterday when I came home from school my terrier angel was gone. My parents said they took her to a farm so she could live a better life. But I know what the... She stops. Sobs well in her chest and tears stream down her face. I pass her a box of tissues. I'm so sorry about your loved one. But you can be a tiger too, you can be just like me. I puff out my chest for good measure. How? Her voice cracks with grief. Show some confidence, remember your dog loved you. Let that love fill you with an unshakable belief in yourself. Be the person your dog saw you as. I say, my voice increasing in volume with each word. As I speak a flurry of golden sparks float from my tongue, they drift into her ears. She gets the message, I see her face and eyes light up. Now you best be on your way. I flip another page. I do believe your parents are making butter noodles tonight. That's your favorite, isn't it? Oh, yes, she says. Without a gentle reminder, my guests would simply forget to slip back into the real world. They could cruise here forever, but too much snooping dissension's magic. Your parents love you very much. They're only lying because they think it's easier on you. I flip through the book. I think it's best for you to play along. Are you sure? Hum, absolutely, but if we chat for too long about it, your butter noodles will get cold. All right, goodbye, Theodore. She says, I hear a resonance in her voice that wasn't there before. Farewell. She skips out the door. Little peanut. I say just as the bell rings independently again. You're going to need your coat, aren't you? I hear her giggle, she twirls around and dons her cold weather gear once more. Thanks, she says, before rushing back into the snow. Though the cold is seeping into my shop, I can feel my heart warming. As soon as the door shuts, my shop disappears. I close the book and toss it onto a random shelf. There's truly no order here, that's just one of my illusions. Brooke's book is, on all counts, blank, there's not a single word in the pages, it's an empty journal, just like everything in Theodore's books. Forever Goodnight by Mike Rush. He forgot to turn the damn alarm off again. She said this aloud through gritted teeth as she threw off the covers, but there was no one there to hear her. As she stomped down the stairs, she tried to remember just how many times this had happened in the last month. Her husband always left for work early. He was the first one out of the bed in the morning, and she was the last one in it at night. It had been that way since they married. She entered the four-digit code and the alarm stopped. A voice from the base, which she referred to as, Bitchin' Betty, said, Alarm off. An alarm was triggered by an entry sensor. Like she needed to be told one more time the details of this infuriating routine. She was mad, and when she finally found her phone, she let her husband know. You forgot to turn off the alarm. Again. That would show him. He always responded with apologies, and occasionally a story about the circumstances that led to his having done so. But it didn't seem to have any effect. He was in a season of forgetfulness. She had explained to him several times that as a writer, she did her best work in the late hours of the evening or even the wee hours of the morning. And as a sleeper, she did her best work, usually from a few hours before sunrise to 10, some mornings even later. Well, she'd had it. They were going to hash this out tonight. 
his morning work focus was resulting in selfish inconsideration of her, and they were going to get into it tonight when he got home. In her stewing, she realized the alarm was not the only thing she was upset about. His damnable snoring would either keep her awake, or wake her up through the night. They had talked. She had pleaded with him to have a sleep study so they could see if he needed a CPAP machine. He had made it clear he didn't want to go to bed every night looking like a fighter pilot. But he had agreed to try a nose strip. It was a flimsy metal strip covered in medical fabric. The strip had a very sticky side so it would adhere to the nose. He'd been wearing one for some time, and she'd even tried it. She breathed better through the night, but his wearing one didn't help him all that much. Or her. She would admit his snoring didn't wake her as often, but she rarely slept through the night. Or the morning. When he left without disarming the damn alarm. When he got home from work, she was waiting. And ready. But she postponed until they'd had dinner to raise her complaint. And then it was on. They had never been any good at talking about the tough stuff. They just ended up fighting. And they were no good at that either. Words they never meant to say always spewed out and scratched each other's hearts. And stuff they thought they'd forgiven were raised from the dead. They never really got anywhere. Oh, complaints about the alarm and the snoring were mentioned, but those couldn't hold center stage very long, and their attention quickly went to some other gripe. In the end, he stormed out for a walk. He'd do this when they'd hit the wall arguing. It was good for his health, well for them both. Their heart rates braked, and they were forced to spend some time apart. He had come home just before his normal time for bed. After setting the alarm, which he regretted had caused all this trouble in the first place, they had a brief but polite, no eye contact exchange. Hi. Hi. I'm going to bed. Okay. She worked on her novel for a little over two hours. In the section she penned, the main character owned up to a mistake he'd made in a relationship. At least half her writing time had been spent trying to get her character to apologize, but he wouldn't, at least, not in an acceptable way. Fatigued and defeated, she began climbing the stairs to her bedroom. When she opened the door, slowly, as to not disturb her sleeping husband, she realized the room was quiet. As fear can make one do, she had several thoughts before the door had moved even a few inches. Maybe her husband had jumped out the window. Could he have died of a heart attack? Would she find him stone cold in the bed? But when the door was completely open, she discovered him lying awake, staring at his phone. Hey, I couldn't sleep. He said to her. Sorry. Was all she said as she walked by to the bathroom. While she brushed her teeth, she realized she would really like to stay mad because he deserved a little wrath but also that the steam had gone out of it. And his words had been about sleep but his tone had been apology. She put on her nose strip and decided she was willing, if he was, to talk more rationally about issues instead of feelings. They spent the next hour sharing kindness from their hearts. She loved this man so, and knew he loved her too. She thought about how she might have to get out of bed and turn the alarm off again in the morning, but at this moment, the thought didn't make her angry. She was pretty sure she'd be able to do it out of love. When they felt sure they'd said all they needed to, she turned out her bedside lamp, casting the room into darkness. They laid, still, in the bed for a few minutes, then did the blanket cuddle, getting themselves into their best, individual, fall-asleep position. And then a few minutes later, they were both on their backs again, staring at the ceiling. He finally asked her if it would be too weird for them to go for a walk together. It didn't seem weird to her at all. They ambled down their street, hand in hand. At the intersection, they crossed over into one of the city's parks, a favorite walking loop. Not long after they'd entered the park, her phone rang. It's 2.30 in the morning. Who could be calling me? She said as she dug the phone from her jeans front pocket. I'm not answering. I don't know this number. It's from New Jersey. It was probably fatigue, but there was a bit of frustration in her voice. They hadn't taken 25 steps and it rang again. Same number. Even more frustration. They continued the loop and when they had walked through the turnaround, they could see their house. 
and flashlights, and police cruisers. It must have been the alarm company. We forgot to turn it off when we left the house, he said as they picked up their pace. They talked, a little breathlessly, about how they were going to walk up onto officers at two-something in the morning after they'd been called to a tripped home alarm. From a pretty good distance, she called out. Officers. She had had to say it again to get their attention. There were two of them, and when they got into their driveway, each officer shone a light in one of their faces. She explained they were the homeowners and how they'd left the house without turning off the alarm. The policemen were understanding and wished them a safe and calm rest of the night. When they got inside, he had a sudden realization. We must have been a sight, he began, walking up on them in the dark like that. And we still had our nose strips on. They got tickled over the thought. The late hour and the accompanying exhaustion turned the moment into the symbols and they laughed so hard they were barely able to breathe, in spite of their nose strips. Having finally calmed down, they turned out the downstairs lights and made their way together to climb the stairs for the last time this evening. When they got to the base of the stairs, he thought she, being in front, would turn on the stairwell light. But instead, she took the first step, turned and faced him eye to eye, and said, I love you, mister, I always will. She put her arms around him, and he returned the gesture. They kissed a few times and then held a long hug. He opened his eyes and pulled away so they could begin the climb. And that's when he saw the dark figure dart from their bedroom across the hall to the guest room. All to the guest room. All to the guest room.